Um, so first, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the conference organizers for inviting me. This is my first time at ASGCT, and I'm thoroughly impressed by uh, the amazing science, creativity of everyone here, and the explosive growth of this field. Um, so it's really amazing, uh, and I'm honored to be here speaking in front of you. Um, so I am a senior medical director at Sangamo Therapeutics. Uh, there I have um, helped develop some in vivo genome editing uh, studies, as well as some cell therapy a gene edited cell therapy um, studies. And, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that, that really isn't very much. Uh, there's a lot we still don't understand about this field. And so this talk is not meant to be all inclusive, but more um, try to explain what we've learned along the way. And when I say we, um, I'm really representing uh, a group of uh, very talented, moded individuals who have a lot of experience across, uh, you know, uh, cl running clinical trials, and some of whom are in the audience here today. Uh, so with that, I'll get started. So uh, first of all, I'm going to try to keep it light. I know you guys have been through three days of sessions, and it's early in the morning. Um, I also want to say that uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about might seem basic for those of you are, who are very familiar with clinical trials, but this is meant to be for a broad audience, so I'm going to be, try to be as descriptive as possible. So safety, safety, safety. If there's, if there's one concept I'd like you to take home from this talk, it is that when you go from preclinical IND um, research to humans, there's a completely different uh, change in mentality, okay? You may be very excited to know, you know, does your therapy work in these patients? Have you done your, your gene editing? Are you seeing expression? Um, but before uh, you can get there, you have to really focus on safety. And why? Because you're not, no longer treating cells, right? You're not treating uh, mice, you're not treating monkeys, you're treating patients, okay? Mothers, sisters, brothers, fathers, you know, these are real people, and when you get to the clinical trial space, you have a commitment. When you start a, a trial therapy, you have to be able to convince everyone that your trial is safe and ethical, okay? So that is the number one priority that you want to put into all of your applications as you start your clinical trial, and that will help you move along much faster. And so these are just some pictures of some of the patients that we have up around our office that always help us remember um, that we are committed and really responsible uh, for, for these patients. So five things you must know to start a gene therapy trial. So first I'm going to go over uh, the process and the timeline. Um, and I think that's really important to know because uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into that. And so if you know the steps, you can plan ahead. Uh, and then I'm going to go over some key points that might help you get through this process with a little bit less frustration. It will be frustrating, no doubt. Um, but really focusing on safety, um, education, and the amount of education that you need to do, planning for success, um, and then obviously attitude is obviously very critical. Starting off with definitions, so IRB, that's kind of the, 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 the one thing that everyone thinks about. It stands for Institutional Review Board, which is an administrative body that is responsible for protecting the rights and welfares of patients who participate in these activities. However, there is another very important committee you should be aware of, the IBC, Institutional Biosafety Committee, um, which is responsible for the oversight of recombinant DNA research, including control of biohazards, microbiological agents, and vectors, et cetera. And so the IRB and the IBC are going to be uh, the key bodies that you're going to be focusing your efforts to get approval to get your gene therapy started. So uh, great to follow on Larry's talk. Congratulations, your IND has been approved. 
okay, so now you've got your clinical protocol, you've got your investigator's brochure, um, which is the key document which is going to include a very detailed summary of all of the preclinical research aspects of manufacturing, et cetera, as well as the risks anticipated with, with, um, with their study drug. And the informed consent form, in the case of children, you'll also be developing an assent form. Uh, just a quick note, um, since 2018, NIH RAC no longer reviews or needs to approve. Uh, this was a, a, a step that took a, a lot of time, um, but new guidance has said that there is no reporting requirements to the NIH, so it's really under the purview of local IBC IRBs and, of course, the FDA. So this is a slide I want to spend a, a minute on just to get the conceptual um, framework correct. So we always think about the IRB as that, that gateway, but actually there are three components to this triangle, the IRB, the contract, <coughs> and the budget. All three of these items need to be in place. All three take a long time to put together, and, and the idea is you want to get them all together and, and complete it at the same time so that you, know, you can really get started with your trial. However, this is gene therapy, don't forget, so there is a lot more um, uh, 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 oversight of what you're doing. So I already mentioned the IRB, Gene Therapy Committee. Um, you may have a Radiation Committee. You may have a Scientific Advisory Committee. Uh, many, many different committees depending on which institution you're at. So you should be prepared for that. And then, of course, at the center of this triangle, you need something. Anyone can guess. Yeah, you will, you'll need a lot of that. So uh, you're going to be needing a very good document management system. There are a lot of documents. So we talked about the key documents, protocol, I, uh, investigator's brochure, and informed consent form. But also additional documents that you want to have ready um, are things such as a study reference manual. This is a manual will tell um, uh, the, the study staff how to do the different tests um, and why, the, why you're doing them. The pharmacy manual, which will explain to the pharmacist how to make your drug. A laboratory manual will tell them how to, which, which, uh, how much blood and which tubes to put them in at what time. Um, if you may have some specific imaging in your study, well, you want to make sure that the images you obtain are consistent across sites. If you're doing MRIs, are they doing the same sequences, etc. So, and a lot of times IRBs will ask for these documents, particularly if they're mentioned in any of, of your of your, uh, your protocol, your IB, and so you want to make sure that you have those documents uh, ready to go uh, if you're asked for those. So now you want to start thinking ahead. How many sites are you going to need to enroll your study? Um, when you're thinking about these sites, you want to make sure that first you get your confidential dis disclosure agreement, CDA, with the site, and you want to do a site feasibility, which I'll talk more about in a few minutes. And then you send them a startup packet, which includes the protocol, investigator's brochure, informed consent form, financial disclosures, 1572, uh, which, which lists the names of the people who are on the study, as well as a contract and the budget, which I mentioned. So um, take a minute to talk about the contract. Um, this is uh, often a major stumbling block. Uh, legal documentation uh, can be very challenging, uh, particularly to uh, folks who, who are not used to that. Definitely was for me. Um, you need to work very closely with your legal team uh, to get these documents together. Um, and, and you may you know, encounter uh, some obstacles. They may be very minor, alone language. So you can't be afraid to read, question, set up the meetings. Just continue to be determined to get that through and work with people by leveraging previously approved formats that can help a lot. Um, and this process can take a while, up to six months. The budget as well is often uh, a very difficult thing to negotiate. Um, every site, um, every hospital will have kind of different standards. You want to start off with the templates provided, uh, either with the grant manager or if you're using a contract research organization. Um, can be very helpful. I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. You want to know the fair market value for tests and procedures uh, and try to maintain equal reimbursement standards. This is one of the things that, um, you know, if you're never going to be completely equal because there are geographic differences uh, in terms of what things cost. 
Uh, however, you want to try to ma maintain that, um, that uh, objectiveness, and, and you don't want it to appear that any particular site is uh, have it getting favoritism. So try to maintain equal reimbursement as much as possible. Um, you, you, I would include a, a stipend for patients or caregivers. It's pretty standard now, anywhere from $50 to $150 per visit, depending on uh, the institution. Um, and then again, expect this process to take a lot of time uh, with back and forth. Now, um, it's really critical that when you get these documents together, you are planning ahead. Planning ahead. Know your dates, okay? Um, the IRB submission uh, often is posted online. You want to know, is this something that's a, a rolling, uh, is it a rolling admission? When are the admission dates? When, it, when are they going to review it? Um, if you miss the date, you know, that you could be basically uh, uh, delaying your study quite a bit. So, so keep an eye on those dates. Where did I go here? All right. So you're almost there, but no, you're not there. <laughs> this is a common theme in gene therapy. Um, you still have to go through these committees, lots and lots of committees. So you know, you're you going to be spending a lot of time at the site. You're going to be spending a lot of time on the phone. Um, you're going to be presenting the materials again and again. Um, and it's important also to involve patient groups um, that can also uh, really influence doctors and, um, and IRBs committees. So once you have your IRB uh, approval, you have an accepted budget and the contract is executed, um, the site initiation visit may occur, and the, the, that's called the SIV, and that's a final training session before the site uh, begins and just requires a lot of people, so make sure you plan that several weeks in advance. Um, and overall, again, the same, same concept we were talking about, persistence, determination, keep track of the process. Here's an example of a checklist, and you can see how many different things that you'll have to keep uh, track of. Um, and so you've got you to be, be just working on it for six to 12 months, so it, it takes a lot of determination. Okay, now I love this picture because this explains to me what your protocol or investigator brochure should, should, make you look, should make you feel, okay? You have something that's potentially dangerous, but look, look at how much safety we've built into this system, right? Um, we are really going to make sure that these patients are safe, and so that's what you want to convey when you get to uh, developing those things. So a thoughtful approach to patient safety, first of all, you should be doing that anyways um, uh, for patients, but also knowing that you've thought about those things ahead of time will really expedite your trial when you're uh, under review by the various boards. Uh, you want a thorough understanding of your non-clinical toxicolog toxicological data. Um, to design your phase one study, you want to incorporate that using a translational method to, to do clinical assessment um, of those potential um, adverse effect events or uh, adverse effects. And you want to anticipate and provide guidance ahead of time so that folks know that you've thought about it and you're going to be looking for that. Um, make the safest, most ethical um, trial for patients. And so, example, um, we all know with AAV, there's a risk of transaminitis. So monitoring for transaminitis, what are you going to do if you, if you get transaminitis? Having some guidance that helps people know that you've already thought about that. Um, maybe you're doing some um, editing of, of cells and doing cell therapy. Well, you know, how are you going to look for potential uh, clonal expansion? Build that into your protocol. Don't wait for them to ask you. Uh, so uh, I would highly recommend including an independent monitoring committee. Um, we have done this in all of our trials. These are external scientific and medical experts with broad experience, preferably uh, having someone wh who's got real experience in the disease state. Um, and you want to vet them for potential conflicts of interest. You want them to be truly objective. And you build these safety reviews into your protocol. So for example, after certain patients are dosed, prior to a dose escalation, this gives um, gives the investigators and the IRBs confidence that, that you are really concerned about safety, you're going to be monitoring, and you're not going to be putting patients uh, at undue risk. So you want to optimize your protocol. Yes, of course, we want to draw every blood, we want to test every antibody, we want to biopsy every organ. Who doesn't? Okay? These 
are not animals. Again, procedures, assessments pose risks to subjects. They also significantly can inhibit your study getting caught up in IRB, and they can actually influence patients uh, not wanting to enroll in your study. So you want to reduce the number of unnecessary tests to what is actually needed for your primary, secondary objectives. Your exploratory objectives, make sure that you really need those. Um, minimize blood volumes. For pediatric trials, this is a critical factor. Um, generally, there's a various guidelines. We generally use um, one ml per kilo per visit and up to three mls per kilo over four weeks. Um, but there's various guidance. But you want to be calculating your estimated blood volumes before you develop all of these things. You don't want to be going in there with a protocol you're going you're to exsanguinate per child. Um, so avoid invasive procedures wherever possible. And if you need them, simulate clinical practice. If there's a, a disease where they're getting an annual lumbar puncture, well, hey, you know, uh, annual lumbar, lumbar puncture is acceptable in the patient population. You can incorporate that into your trial. Um, if you're trying to do procedures that are not part of clinical practice, you've got to have a really, really good reason. So the informed consent form, um, this is a document uh, that is absolutely critical. Spend a lot of time on it, okay? It's going to provide detailed information about study procedures, risks, and benefits. The key here is it cannot be in scientific language. It has to be in lay language, um, which is often very difficult uh, to do, uh, especially for folks who, who are really uh, familiar and, and very technical and scientific. Um, and then you may need to develop, if you're going to do pediatrics, older and child, younger child ascents. And these are, these are not easy to write. Um, you know, you have to start using analogies for, for gene, gene therapy. Um, and you want to make sure you use very short sentences. And there are actually some resources out there um, that will allow you to analyze a paragraph and tell you the grade, lead, grade level. So utilize those resources so that you don't have to go to the IRB, get their comments, and go back and change it again. Um, the risk language is going to be really important. Um, that is something your company is going to need, to, or your company or your, your institution is going to need to align on. Um, we'll, we like to use this format of what are the possible side effects, what are the unlikely side effects, what are the very unlikely side effects. But you want to make sure there's a transparent description of the safety risks, and you also want to address any risk of immunogenicity and malignancy. Um, those are definitely uh, potential risks of these therapies, and so you really want to be upfront about it. So these ICFs, they can be scary, okay? They can be, they can be scary, they should be, um, because you, know, you, you want to be, um, you want to inform them of the risks. All right, education. <laughs> Now, uh, you may say, I'm doing um, you know, immunotherapy for cancer. What does it have to do with cloning? And my answer is exactly, <laughs> right? There's a lot of stuff out there in the media and uh, a lot of misconceptions about what's going on. And so uh, your job will be to educate them again and again and again because they are not uh, scientists. They don't necessarily understand all the complicated science that you guys are doing. Um, so many people are not familiar with gene therapy, genome editing. Uh, you can imagine I had to uh, try to explain to people what zinc finger nucleases are, you know, and uh, it's not that easy. Uh, so you want to you wanna streamline this complicated scientific background, and this may take several visits, presentations, discussions. Uh, you may need to, to go to the IRB several times. I, I certainly did. Um, and you just want to be really uh, determined. Uh, to do whatever you can, really, to, to ensure that, that the trial can be moving forward. So really putting in a lot of effort. And you may get examples of certain uh, common questions like this. Can the virus replicate? What is the risk of transmission to others? How do you monitor for side effects such as integration or off-target editing? Why can't patients receive a higher dose a second time? Maybe these are questions that are obvious to you. The answers are obvious to you, um, but they're not obvious to everybody else. Um, and so it's important to, to remember that a lot of times um, you are helping them build a, a gene therapy program. All right, so a couple tips for success. This is where we all want to get to uh, a treated child with a genetic disease who's, who's cured. Um, so number one, site feasibility. Uh, oftentimes we think the site that's the most famous is the best site. Uh, that is not the case. <laughs> um, you want to do a feasibility assessment. 
how many patients with the condition, how many of those patients do you expect to enroll, and then you want to understand what are the capabilities of the site. You know, do they have the right um, instruments? Can they get an MRI in less than eight weeks? You know, I mean, that kind of thing. Um, does the PI have experience? Does the institution have experience? Don't go on reputation alone. You need to find this information out before you get started. And then PI engagement is absolutely critical, probably the primary factor. If your PI is not engaged, um, it, this will be like pulling teeth. It will be very difficult. A PI, whoever has influence, knows the IRB chair, can make things go a lot faster. And if they have clinical trial experience on top of that, they know the process, they can plan ahead, they have the resources. You also want to definitely be reaching out to patients, patient groups, advocacy groups. They have a lot of influence. Um, and can really change the momentum of your study uh, if they are supporting that. All right. So uh, recruitment, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, genome editing is very exciting, okay? But not for me, <laughs> you know? That's what people say. People don't wanna be genome edited. That's not something that people are looking forward to. Um, you know, it's scary. Uh, we understand that this therapy maybe could help them, but it's a very scary thing. And so you want to create informational material, get it to doctors and patients, um, and you really want to get your name out there either by advertising. Uh, I would definitely recommend doing social media. Um, a lot of times we're working on rare diseases, and rare diseases, the, the networks are very strong through social media or sponsorship at patient events. A contract research organization, so um, if you uh, can afford to have this and you have a larger trial, it's really helpful to have one because there's so much of this day-to-day -day stuff, as I mentioned, which is hard to keep track of, so they help with that. And you may have heard of some, some names, PPD, Covance, Quintiles, MedPace, etc. cetera. Um, so this is something that probably would be very helpful. Uh, you will be using a lot of vendors uh, and, and vendors can be your best friend or worst enemy. Uh, you're going to be using them to look at your clinical laboratory testing and results. Um, you're going to be using them to develop any imaging parameters, uh, training your staff. Uh, you definitely want someone managing your clinical trial data, right? That's very valuable data, maybe used to get the drug approved one day. Um, and then also for pharmacovigilance, safety reporting, and patient travel. All right, so forgive me, I had to put one dad joke in here because uh, uh, you know, I have two, two little girls and if I didn't put a dad joke, they would just be very disappointed. Um, but attitude is absolutely critical, okay? Um, and what I mean by attitude is this is a very uh, challenging field that we're in. Um, it gets more challenging the further you go down this pathway. Uh, and it can be very frustrating. Uh, you, you need many people from different organizations to work together and personal relationships can make a difference. Being professional and courteous in all interactions and being patient um, and determined. Remember, these PIs are, have a lot of companies or a lot of trials that they're considering. Um, and one, you know, a friendly versus curt email could mean uh, the difference between your study being picked up or, or the IRB reviewing your study this month versus next month. Okay, so, so always be professional. Um, just to end, um, dedication to serving your patients should always be the driving factor. If that's your guiding light, you will be successful. Um, there will be bumps in the road, plan for the unexpected. And uh, you know, it's tough out there, so be prepared to show up and bring your A game. Thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge the people who, who helped me with this uh, talk and uh, everyone at Sangamo. Thanks again. I'll be happy to take some questions. We have time. We have time for a couple of questions. And I thank you for a very, actually, I think very useful uh, presentation as we're getting questions, potential questions. So site visits. Um, yes. I certainly, I really did appreciate your comment uh, on sometimes the biggest names, not the best. And I just double checked your bio. So just so you understand, this is a gentleman <laughs> who got his MD, PhD for UCLA, then went to Memorial Sloan Kettering, then worked in the Harvard system. And he's telling you, <laughs> potentially, they might not be the best places to go to. But so what, from your standpoint, what, what makes that site visit the most useful thing? To, you know, what, what, are, when you, the teams there, yeah, from, 
you're, you have potential options. So what's important information you're trying to get from the site to choose it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as, as I kind of mentioned there, I think the PI engagement piece is the hardest piece to get. Um, and that's just because, you know, uh, that there's a lot of distrust out there and there's a lot of, you know, there's a, uh, any physician has, has hundreds of demands on their time all the time. So just to get their attention and to say, hey, can you take time? They're very busy. They've got a clinical schedule. They've got a bunch of patients. Um, so when we start out, what we do is a, a site qualification visit at the beginning where we go out there, we talk to the PIs, we see their facilities, um, we understand if kind of, if, if this is something that could go. Um, but again, if you're at an institution where the PI is a big name, published tons of papers, is on all these chairs and committees, um, there's a good chance uh, he or she might not have the time really to commit to your trial and show up at IRB meetings and make these phone calls and, and, and call up the patients, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fine line. The other thing is we usually uh, try to develop several sites because you never know where you're going to hit bumps in the road. So that's part of kind of risk mitigation is you want to, you want to have enough sites such that if, if some of your sites don't um, end up kind of getting through, that you'll still be able to recruit in your trial. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. There, then, all right. Go ahead. So quick question. Um, in terms of quantifying resiliency, how much resiliency do you have to have? Maybe it could be measured in um, how long does it take from your informed consent to activating the trial? How long does it take this process of going through the IRB? Just yeah, general so I, I would say from beginning to end, when, so when you're starting, I'll say that the starting point is, you know, you're sending out your site packet till the end, anywhere from 6 to 12 months. And so it really depends on, again, uh, if, are they familiar with gene therapy? I mean, I, the hope is this time frame is going to shorten, right? Um, I think uh, when we started, there was a lot of places that didn't, weren't as familiar. Now they're more familiar. The, the second trial, the third trial, the fourth trial, those are going to be going uh, a lot faster. But it, it does require a lot of patience. What do you do in situations when you have, uh, you know, you're a big name investigator, but they want to uh, pass this trial off to somebody they're mentoring, a, a junior faculty member, a mid-level faculty member. How do you make the, the, the distinction as to whether this is, you know, going to be productive or, or, and how involved the person's going to be? Because junior faculty are busy, too. They're trying to, you know, get their, themselves established. It's, uh, how do you evaluate in that situation? Yeah, yeah. So interesting, so sometimes I prefer the junior faculty member. <laughs> um, so the junior faculty members often um, are looking to get experience, they're looking to get onto trials. Um, they may have more time, for example. Um, and and, and you, you just kind of have to evaluate what the relationship is and how much time you think they're going to be able to commit. Um, I personally uh, try to develop relationships with each PI or junior investigator myself. Uh, so that I really understand them and can help motivate them to, to work on these studies. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, uh, on single center versus multi center. Uh, you mentioned uh, risk mitigation on one hand, but then on the other hand, if you're working with multi center, you have complexities in different protocols and then data management, and it's also, it's also rare diseases, so you have few patients in each, uh, in each uh, institution. And also another complexity that I, I wonder is that once you have a multicenter, you need to uh, maybe have a one place for processing the cells, so you need to ship them, et cetera. So I, yes, I, yeah. absolutely. No, no, you're, you're, you're correct. I mean, so when you do a multicenter, it's a very challenging, particularly for cell therapy, the manufacturing. There are certain time windows that cells have to get to the processing plant, uh, plant et cetera. Um, and then sometimes you're talking about just, not just multi-center, but you know, multi-country, and that adds a whole another element. So all of those things um, take a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, so if you have the luxury of that, you can attack that. Um, it depends on the trial design, how many patients you are. Do you think you can enroll it from one site? Um, that's one thing. Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, depends on the site. There are some sites which are an encatchment for a very large geographic area. And so, for example, um, in the UK, 
you know, they have a centralized system where a lot of patients kind of come into London. So you, that's a place where maybe one site would work. In a place like the U.S. where everybody's kind of far off from each other, it's very challenging to enroll, say, a, a rare disease trial with a single site. So I just have a quick question. You had a, um, a slide up on um, the CROs um, and the few that are listed up there. Any, any thoughts or considerations around selection of CROs when you think about you know, those that have gene therapy experience versus not and you know, other considerations that may be helpful for our audience here? Yeah. Um, CROs are a kind of a, a bit of a, a challenging subject. Uh, you're a asking me how, how do I pick CROs, how do I do that? You know, it's, it's tough. It's a hit or miss. Um, all the CROs are capable of doing stuff. Some of them have gene therapy experience. Um, there may be a particular um, skill that a certain CRO has. For example, they're very familiar with cell therapy and, and the whole logistics piece. That could help. But I would say that every CRO, generally the way we call them, they have an A team, a B team, and a C team, right? So if you're a Pfizer, maybe you can get the A team. Uh, if you've got a tiny little study, you know, maybe you're going to get the C team. You've got to constantly evaluate them and work with them. Um, but uh, they are also, you know, your partners. And so the more that you educate them, you get them involved, the more motivated they'll be. And our CRO members, I will tell you, now work like a part of our own team. Um, and so we are on a great terms with them and we really like them. Okay. Could you comment on the statistical analysis plan and where that fits in in this? It's such a big component of any study. Yes, yeah. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So you definitely want to put in some information about your statistical analysis plan. Usually when you're starting a phase one, two study, it's, it's very basic, it's not very um, detailed. Uh, you're going to be mainly doing descriptive analysis. Your primary endpoint is safety and tolerability. Um, and then you can, uh, you can, most of your exploratory and stuff, you may have to say a few statements about your secondary endpoints, about how you're going to measure a certain protein or a, a certain endpoint, you know, a laboratory measure. But it's actually very minimal at this stage when you're starting. You will have to have complete your statistical analysis plan before the end of your study. That's when you have to finalize it. And so by that point, you'll, you'll understand it. And if for later stages of clinical trials, statistics is much, much more, more important. But here we're talking about safety and tolerability. That's what we're trying to establish. And we do that one patient at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.